Welcome back. So how was the session? You got some new ideas? You must be wondering now, this RPA is happening in enterprises. How good would it be if uh, RPA can happen in our own office? So instead of articles, we don't need to go through the hassle of having all the articles. We can have the RPA, and then the RPA will do all the audit. The only thing I have to do is sign and collect the money. The money comes to my account. Uh, that's going to happen, but it will uh, take time. But you also need to remember that uh, the most important thing, even when you use RPA, is application of human intelligence. So the need for auditors is always going to be there. Now we'll move on to the uh, next session. Uh, we have learned about what is RPA, what robotic process automation are all about. Now we'll get into the practical application of this machine learning concept in the enterprise world. And for speaking on this particular uh, topic, we have uh, Mr. Babu Jandran, who says he's an auditor of the Jurassic Age. But if you look at, his, uh, uh, look at him, you find that the more uh, white his hair has become, his wisdom has increased. He passed his chartered accountancy more than three years back. You will always find his 10 years ahead of information technology. So without too much ado, I welcome uh, Babu Jandra to come and, and make the presentation. And we will have lesser formalities as we go now. So I will do the welcome, at, welcome to Babu. And then uh, request him to take over. Good morning to all of you. At the very outset, I want to thank uh, the Bangalore branch, the chairman, and Rafi for making this technology summit and organizing it and making it a success based on what I see here as the audience. And thank you all for coming. At the very outset, I must tell you that I've got 45 minutes to talk on a subject which is pretty complex, uh, that is artificial intelligence, which is AI. However, the reason why I was very particular that this topic be included is only because of the fact that this is going to be the future. It's not just me who is saying this, but even as of yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, Sundar Pichai of Google made the same statement. And there's huge investment going on worldwide on AI. AI is not a very new concept in terms of the fact that the thought process started nearly 20 to 25 years back. However, it has become extremely popular now only because of the fact that in the olden days we didn't have computational power and there was no data. Today, we have got computational power and there are huge volumes of data. And that's the reason why AI has become very popular. So, in that brief context, let me now get into the presentation. Yeah. See, the need of the R is that we have data. We have always had MIS. Then we had business intelligence. Now comes in AI for forensics and then for patterns. And today, detecting suspicious patterns has become exceedingly important. The reason for this is the huge transaction volume that are there in organizations. That is, whether it is retail, whether it is banking, there are huge, huge transaction volumes. And with this digital India coming, it is going to be humanly impossible for anyone to start writing, uh, I mean, going and vouching like the way we used to do in the earlier days. So when we talk in terms of detecting patterns, the basic assumption is that you have huge volumes of data from the past, which you can analyze and try to establish a pattern. I will explain this to you in more detail, and I will try to show you real life examples also based on my experience. However, to 
explain what is artificial intelligence, you see this slide. And it tells you here that if you see here, it is thought and behavior. Here it is human and rationale. So systems that think like humans, systems that think rationally, systems that act like humans, and systems that act rationally. I don't know whether you all have heard this word singularity. Singularity today is a word that's being used very much in the tech world. And what it means is the way things are going and the speed at which artificial intelligence is growing, there will be a day where there will be technology which can actually mimic a human being. Uh, very recently, there was a talk by Masayoshi Son of SoftBank where he has created the first humanoid that can smell and has got, um, you know, can, uh, has the feeling of senses. And he is investing extremely a lot of money in ensuring that this is the future because he strongly believes in it. And as you know, he's an investor who invests in things you know, which is, he sees things that are 30 years ahead. Now come to what we call as neural networks. If I read this, I will explain this to you. A neural network is a series of algorithms that attempts to identify underlying relationships in the set of data by using a process that mimics the way the human brain operates. So fundamentally, what a neural network does, which is a part of artificial intelligence, is it tries to mimic the human brain. Neural networks have the ability to adapt to changing input, which is an extremely powerful thing, because you cannot, it is very, very difficult, if you have to catch a credit card fraud, to have a program that will identify a credit card fraud. The only way you can identify a credit card fraud is to identify suspicious patterns when it's all put together you figure out that this could be a fraud. Okay, so identifying, so the changing input as the uh, input changes uh, what happens is the power of neural networks is that the output changes automatically and it learns exactly like the human brain learns. Now, this is not a class in neurosciences or neurology. But the reason I put this slide is though, so that you know the history of artificial intelligence and how it is being now used in the world of technology. The biological brain, which is our brain, has got about a hundred billion neurons. And these neurons get input and it processes it and it sends out an output. The only thing is that these neurons do different types of work. So for example, we all know that there are things called motor neurons, which are neurons for the purposes of moving the, uh, you know, our legs, our muscles. So when a person has Parkinson's disease, it's the motor neurons that are affected. We have sensory neurons which will tell us that if we touch something, it is hot or whether it's cold. Right? So we have different types of neurons in the human brain which does different types of work. And <clears throat> the difference between a biological neuron and a neuron that is used in neural networks is that in the, uh, uh, in the uh, near, uh, medical world, in the human brain, you know, these are actually, when it fires, it fires a signal, okay, in the human brain. Whereas, in the computer world, it knows only zeros and ones, okay. So, it is all, uh, you know, a black and white situation. So this, this thing, you don't have to go into the details of this, but basically why I put up this slide is this black represents what is 
the, the, the biological neuron. And this, what you see on this side, is what has been created in artificial intelligence. So there are things called synapses in the human brain. And accordingly, what has happened here is that we call it as connections in the real, uh, in the technology world. You have a neuron cell body, and what we call here is an emulated neuron, which is this one, which is in the computer world. And you have what is an axon, which is the one, the, you know, these things which actually send information in the human brain, which is a, a fiber, but in the techni technical world, it's a wire. Okay. So th this is how uh, you map uh, what the biological inspiration is for the purposes of technology. Now, taking that slide, so you have a lot of nodes here, input nodes, where you can send a lot of information. You have a lot of hidden nodes in the middle which will do the processing and send out outputs which will all get added up in order to come out with a result. Now, I must highlight to you here one very important thing about neural networks and its power. The human mind is only able to process three dimensions. It can do X, Y, and Z. When you go into the fourth dimension, most of us cannot see it. You know, and it's extremely difficult to process more than three dimensions. And that is why the maximum we can see is an info cube, or we can understand an info cube. Now, with neural networks, the number of variables that you can have to process is n number, it's infinite. It can handle any amount of variables. So when it can handle, so when you have this input which is coming on the left hand side, this input can go right up to n. This input, when I say can go right up to n, it means that I should be able to plot something where I can see a result. Now this cannot be plotted in a graph. So in artificial intelligence, they've got their own ways of plotting called coherent maps. And it is plotted in a co coherent map and it's stored digitally. Okay? Now, you can imagine, if I have these inputs, I'll be coming to it, I'll give you an example from the banking environment. If I'm having these inputs that are coming in, and just imagine if I want to see the pattern of a certain customer in a bank, and if I can plot, not a graph, but store it in a coherent map, the pattern of a customer based on his deposits, based on his withdrawals, based on the time of day of his withdrawals, based on his frequency, based on his IP address, based on his uh, uh, time of day when he withdraws, you can imagine what a powerful graph you will get regarding the behavior of that customer. Okay, so that is the reason why it's very, very important that you have this uh, uh, neural networks to do this type of analytics. Now, there are many AI platforms today that are available and uh, being used, uh, uh, you know, worldwide. Uh, IBM's Watson Analytics is absolutely outstanding. For any of you who haven't seen it, please go. It is, I mean, you can... You can actually see it on YouTube or, you know, you can just register with IBM Watson Analytics. They give you a one-month free trial. And uh, they give you data sets to play around with. And, uh, like, if you go into IBM's Watson Analytics, I can actually do, I mean, not me, Watson will actually do if I give a hashtag from a Twitter feed. So I can put a hashtag of CA Technology Summit Right? And it will do uh, analytics and it will send me back the results of that. So I can do a hashtag on Donald Trump and I will get everything that you want to know based on how those tweets have, uh, you know, influenced social media. Okay. Now, this is very, very powerful. So what these companies have done is that you have uh, IBM, for, they have Watson Analytics, then Google, as you know, they went and bought a, a company called 
DeepMind from uh, UK for about 450 million pounds. And they have also created TensorFlow, where a lot of these, uh, please remember that a lot of the algorithms that are running in machine learning are very, has got a lot of high-end mathematics. So they have got a lot of people like Google, they have, they, the TensorFlow has been created by uh, what Google calls as their brain team, uh, where they have a lot of mathematicians uh, who actually work on all these algorithms. And after that, they put it up so that, uh, you know, other people can use it uh, through their APIs. Then you have Microsoft, uh, which have got their own cognitive services. Then you have Voyager Labs from Israel. Amazon has their own, and Facebook also have their own. And if you look at it like Google, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, Facebook, one of the things common is they have huge volumes of data. And they have very high-powered machines to do the number crunching and all this analytics. So uh, you need data for this. Now, in terms of what chartered accountants like you can do and how you can contribute into these areas is in any area, like for example, you take uh, you know retail in the retail space. If you want to do something on frauds, or you know on analytics and all that, you can actually think in terms of what rules that you have to contribute to someone who can create that algorithm for you. Okay, and that is because you have the domain knowledge. I was lucky enough to get involved in a consulting assignment from 2006 where I have been involved with a company where we have um, created a product using artificial intelligence and neural networks where I had given my domain knowledge and we did it with some 30, 40 programmers and today the product is up and running. Some of the examples that I'm going to give you is what I've actually done and what we have actually done so that Rather than making it theoretical here, I said that let me show you the practical side of artificial intelligence and neural networks. So, the example is on banks. And the reason I think this is very apt in today's demonetization is that when we were involved in creating this product, we created for money laundering and for catching frauds in banks. And the reason why I did that, because as you know, that money laundering has become a huge problem worldwide. So based on that, we developed this product, you know, start about 10 years back we started, but it's up and running now. But I'll show you some of the, the, the thought process that has gone into building this product and how artificial intelligence can help in uh, identifying uh, you know, fraud activities and laundering activities in banks. If you see this on this side, I don't know whether the people at the back can see this. One minute, I'll just expand. Here, the, the, the st this tab in the green says business intelligence. So what, what you have is you have data analytics. In business intelligence, you have data analytics, you have data mining, you have statistical analysis, risk, I mean rules, geospatial analysis, etc. Now, when you come to artificial intelligence, which is the blue tablet here, it talks in terms of neural networks, burst detectors, pattern analysis, clue detectors, money laundering, uh, and fraud scenario library, mem memorizer, etc. I'll explain this as we go along. Then uh, you also have peer profiling. You know, you have peer group analysis, profile behavior, risk profiling, and of course you have case management. Now, the advantage that one has 
with artificial intelligence and neural networks is that uh, your one is that you're going through the com all the whole lot of transactions and when you're talking about frauds it really doesn't matter uh, the concept of materiality really doesn't come up okay even if it's a small 25 rupee um, uh, someone there's a theft in a bank you know you got to get that person out of that bank so you know uh, and these type of products really don't look at the materiality unless you create a specific rule saying that you're looking for something greater than a hundred thousand okay. <clears throat> so what happens in this uh, uh, you know uh, let, let me now you may wonder because I'm talking about specific money laundering and uh, I'm talking about banks you may wonder what is the difference between a normal query which is running in a bank for money laundering and what a neural network does okay I'll give it to you in a small example if you run a money laundering software in a bank which works on a simple query which I have seen the query may say that if there is a 500 percent increase in the closing balance of a customer between yesterday and today consider it a burst okay now that is a, that is a query that is there which is running in a bank you assume a situation where all staff employees there get their salaries let us say that on the at the 30th of the month or 29th of the month so if an employee gets a salary of say 80,000 on the 29th of the month actually on the 28th on the previous day it's but natural that if he's paid his EMIs his house expenses and all that the closing balance could be just 6,000 or 7,000 so if you take the difference based on that algebraic equation of greater than 500 percent most of the salaries that are credited into the bank account will come as if it is a burst and this will be a false positive from money laundering perspective okay now when you have too many false positives it is impossible for a caseworker to go in and find out what is the real suspicious activity so in neural networks what happens is they will take the transactions of a bank for the past year so let's assume a bank has 1 million transactions a day with say 10 million customers you will take the transactions of that 10 million custom customers for the previous 365 days and then you will run it through a neural network which will study the deposit pattern withdrawal pattern time of day withdrawals frequency of withdrawals etc and create a pattern of that customer once you get that pattern of that customer any non-linear outlier will only be treated as a suspicious activity okay. so in the example I gave you if a neural network was there it will have a graph which will say that on the 29th you get salary and the graph will come down till the 28th of the next month then again it will go up you'll get salary it will come down again it will go up the next month and it will come down and anything outside this pattern is only and if he suddenly gets a deposit of one crore into that account right those things will be considered as outliers so this is the I don't know whether you can see it from the bank uh, this is uh, practically this is how it happens you have the source data coming here right this is from say current account savings account loans trade finance uh, you know uh, this is Forex and the private equity you have credit cards so this is the source data coming from your co-banking system so this can be Finical, this can be Flexcube 
you get this source data. You pull this data into a, a, a de for, uh, into a data warehouse and then I, uh, ultimately into the neural network uh, that has been created. So this data that uh, which is coming is what I was telling you. This could be one million transactions a day for 365 days. So you take that. Then you run it through the neural networks, which will actually go and start plotting the patterns of every single customer. Okay. Now, based on today's computing power and based on my experience, for 10 million customers uh, with 1 million transactions a day for 365 days, the neural network will take about three days to memorize. Okay. Uh, because there's a lot of uh, uh, computations going on within for the uh, system to memorize. So it'll take about three days of running. Once you do that, then it'll come out here. You know, you have the other tools here, like, you know, you do your analytics, you have your business intelligence, and then you can get it on an email, you can get it on a mobile, uh, you know, whatever the output is for the case workers. Okay, this is the execution flow. I don't know whether you can see it at the back, but I'll just show you. So these are the transactions coming in from this side, uh, which are the transactions, the banking transactions that are coming in from this side. And they go through, so you have the historical customer information, you have all your rules here, and then you have your, all your burst detectors here. These burst detectors are coming from neural networks uh, where it will uh, you know, identify a burst uh, based on the algorithm that we create. So here you have the burst detectors. Then based on this combination of rules and uh, these burst detectors, it will give a combination score, uh, which will send an alert. And all you know, these transactions come in. Some of the transactions will go out as green transactions, which are good transactions. And some of the transactions will come out as red transactions, which are the ones that the caseworker has to go and uh, check. Now this profiling, this is the, oops, okay, this is the way in which the, uh, uh, you know, like uh, I can't show it like I said because this has got, can, this is a very simple x, y axis plotting. So this is what you call as profiling. Now if you see here, right, this is electronic fund transfer, this is ATM, this is check. Joe has a winter season behavior, software can mimic Joe's profile for winter automatically and detect deviations. So when you plot it, you can make out here that if to, this is the time of day and this is the amount, so this particular person, right, he does a lot of things, does a lot of electronic fund transfers uh, of a higher value at a later part of the day. So let me give, if, let me say that I'll give you another example. Let's say that you know, I live here very close, uh, close to this R Richmond uh, Road. Let's say that, not let's say, it's not, not an assumption. I mean, I actually go for a walk every morning at about 6. So if I am withdrawing whenever I go for my morning walk from an ATM nearby on Richmond Road, say 5,000 rupees for my weekly expenses, the system has the information that Babu always withdraws money from an ATM of this specific IP address, at 5, 000, and the amount he normally withdraws is 5,000 rupees a week. And this is done on, say, three times a week or two times a week or whatever it is, right? All that information is available. Now, if suddenly there is a withdrawal from my account of, say, 20,000 from, say, Jaipur from an IP address which is unknown, it means Either I have gone there for some wedding or something like that, or somebody has skimmed my card. Okay. So that is how you will, this type of profiling helps. So you, you've got to actually take this right across channels. Uh, you know, you've got to look at a ATM, credit cards, uh, you know, trade finance, internet banking, then you've got to look at static events, you know, mobile change, address change, dynamic events like transactions in quick time span. I will show you an example of that. Then geospatial analysis, uh, you know, that is based on where an ATM is 
physically located? I'll show you that also. So for fraud detection and prevention, you see, when you're talking in terms of patterns, um, there are a lot of patterns that you have to look at. You've got to look at the spend pattern, the income pattern, the fund flow pattern, the deviation from peers, uh, then peer grouping, base scoring. Peer grouping, base scoring is, uh, you know, let's say that I'm a young IT professional. I can create a peer group for young IT professionals and say that there are pe people between, say, more, you know, uh, 23 and uh, uh, 28, for example. And I can tell, say that, you know, uh, these are people who get a salary of X amount a month at an average, and their spending is about, say, every week X amount. These are assumptions that you can make. And then if you have a customer in a bank who happens to fall within that peer group, you can compare with that peer group, you can compare this customer's behavior and include that as a scope to establish his risk. So the, there are patterns of transactions in time, the amount patterns, etc. Now, uh, when you talk in terms of event-driven architecture, you have, uh, you know, for financial services, uh, consumer behavior. So if I talk in terms of consumer behavior, a card has been used five times in the same restaurant over the last few minutes. It could be an abnormality, right? So then disparate sources, multiple events on the same account, alternate channels being used. Like somebody has never used internet banking and you suddenly see an internet banking transaction coming in. So, you know, that can be an abnormality. Then negative account balances unusual number of transactions in account in recent past, then account being accessed from multiple IP addresses in quick time, uh, you know, where it's physically not possible to go from uh, one ATM to the other. And that I'll give, show you a uh, screenshot of a real life thing uh, which uh, the system has picked up. Okay, then proximity location tracking between two successive transactions of watch list and abnormal usage at a remote ATM kiosk in the last two hours. Now, in the, this demonetization scenario, you can imagine it is extremely difficult if you do not have artificial intelligence to sort of figure out whether there are bursts in transactions. Uh, you know, uh, so you need tools like this. The good thing is that the PMLA Act came in a few years back. So it was mandated by a Reserve Bank that these type of tools must be there in banks. Uh, they didn't specifically say that it has to be a tool that is using neural networks and artificial intelligence, but these tools have to be in banks. And uh, you have to, uh, you know, send to the FIU the, um, you know, cash transaction report and the suspicious uh, activity report, you know, on a monthly basis. So because of that, now the need for such tools becomes very, very important in order if you want to, you know, highlight and try to pick out this type of information. Now, since you all can't see this uh, right from the back there, I'll just read it out to you. So basically, you don't have to bother about all this. You have a, a fraud engine and you have a banking application and systems which is actually sending information to this. So you have, uh, you know, you have the, uh, this uh, CEP stands for complex event processing and uh, AN is clue detectors. Uh, when I say uh, this complex event processing, what it actually means is, uh, say, you know, you have a lot of phishing attacks that are happening today in banks. A lot of people are getting into someone else's account through internet banking. Uh, and so once I have the user ID, and uh, once I have the user ID and password, I can actually withdraw. But what you should remember is that in order to identify that it was a fraudulent activity, you've got to look at the events, not in isolation, but as a combination of events, okay? And that's what complex event processing is about. So how do, what does a fraudster do when he gets into somebody else's bank account? 
the first thing he will do, he will go and change the customer's static data. When I say that he's going to change the customer's static data, what I mean is he will change the mobile number. The second thing he's going to do, he's going to add a beneficiary which was not there in the previous list of beneficiaries. The third thing he will do is he will not on the same day because it takes 24 hours for the beneficiary to get added. The next thing he will do is within 24 hours, he will withdraw more than 90% of that account. Okay, and that will go into the account of the new beneficiary that he has added. Now, the advantage of complex event processing is that it is temporal. When I mean temporal, it is time-based. So I can actually create a rule which says that if somebody changes the mobile number, that is the static data, and within 10 minutes or 5 minutes, he adds a beneficiary, and after 24 hours, he is making a huge transfer out, to the beneficiary that he has added, this could be fraudulent. Okay? Yeah. So that is the whole idea on this. Right. Now, uh, these are some actual screenshots I wanted to just show you. In this particular case, cash deposits are made very close to the threshold of 50,000. So it's all 49,000 deposits in the bank of 49,000. Cash deposits take place almost daily. Sometimes the amounts are transferred in less than two hours of the cash deposit. Sometimes the amount is accumulated over a period and a demand draft has been taken. The balance is kept almost zero and no big transaction after that and not a single non-cash deposit transaction. This is the screenshot. You can see here all 49,000 deposit and you see this huge all the deposits by cash and the withdrawals are by DD similar patterns in other accounts okay this is another example high activity in a new account opened huge cash deposits ac accumulating to millions burst in ATM withdrawals accumulating to same amount account balance comes zero no transactions after funds are washed out. You can see here, this is the date of opening the account. If you see this graph, this graph looks more like an ECG. Okay, this graph, the brown, uh, the blue is the deposits and the brown is the withdrawal. Now, it's very, very important that uh, you have uh, visual displays to uh, case workers. Or the only reason being that just by looking at this graph, you can make out that money as soon as it's coming in, it's going out. This static change in event occurs, which I explained to you just now. This is uh, where I told you the phishing attack. So here the system tells you. Oops. Yeah, here the system tells you that there was a change in static data and there's a burst here which is showing as an abnormality burst in debit amount in the account it shows you here this is multiple transaction using the same card as different ro this is geo geospatial analysis same card at different location it is impossible to travel to these locations in the same short span of time so if you look at this This is withdrawals from two different ATMs. Withdrawals from two different ATM locations at the same time. Here, if you see the time, even the seconds are the same. Right? And these are the, trans these are the transactions that have been withdrawn from two different locations. Here, withdrawals at two different, uh, two different cities in a span of 12 minutes. One of these ATMs, the IP address is given here. One is in Hyderabad and one is in Bangalore within 12 minutes difference. Now this is extremely difficult uh, if you do not have, uh, uh, you know, tools like AI and all to catch. It's very, very difficult.
I just got two more. Just two more. Uh, so. uh, then this is small value transactions. This also the system has thrown out multiple transactions with small amount uh, that is less than 50 rupees with same description. The amounts deposited has been withdrawn as cash. Some transactions referred to as uh, general ledger and there are some small value transactions like one, two. Now in this example, you will notice that all the description says puja deduction and you'll see 25 rupees being credited into someone's account. And it says 112 times 25 rupees credited on the same day and for many days, okay, it's been. So in this particular case, what that person was doing was it was an employee who actually uh, checkbook was 25 rupees. He used to debit the customer and credit his account. So, you know, and this, this is a pattern which was thrown out by, through artificial intelligence. Uh, it was thrown out only because of the fact that this was not normal behavior. If you see his past uh, deposits and withdrawal, this came out as a, a, a nonlinear outlier, so you could make out. This is anytime, anywhere banking where any, it's been misused by some people. Uh, <coughs> in this particular case, the KYC was done in the western part of India and uh, anytime, anywhere banking is actually given for the customer to use that credit card anytime, anywhere. It is not for somebody else to use it anytime, anywhere. Okay, and in this particular case what happened was all the ATM cash transactions in another, is taken off in another geography. So what these people were doing was there was someone depositing uh, cash, cash in, uh, in the western part of India and within about an hour it is being withdrawn from the eastern part of India uh, within about half an hour to one hour from the time it was deposited. So, <clears throat> and these are not small amounts. There were deposits of 49,500, about 50 to 60 in one person's account in the western part of India and it, is, it was withdrawn in the eastern part of India by 10,000 then another 10,000, then another 10,000. And the funny thing that we could find based on the analytics that we did was that the ATM withdrawals, the IP addresses of all the uh, withdrawals was from the s in the same railway line. So the person used to get into one station, withdraw 10,000, get off in a, a two or three stations later, take for another 10,000 from another station, and that's the way he did it. And this you know, the, the, these are things that can be for anything. It can be for terrorist financing, it can be anything. It can be laundering, but uh, it is an absolutely abnormal and unusual activity, which only artificial intelligence can give you. Right. So, I hope I have not uh, overshot, because I'm pretty paranoid about that. Rafik, I hope I have not overshot. So. Uh, I'm sorry I had to rush through this because uh, it's very difficult to explain this in 45 minutes. But having said that, I wish you all the very best and thank you again for coming. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. My name is Venkatesh Padiyal. Yeah. Uh, I'm from industry. Uh, I've been in retail and uh, currently working in telecommunication. I just felt it is relevant for me to mention just one thing with your permission. Sure. Uh, when I was in retail, I was actively trying to find people because we do a lot of, as a part of retail, you will understand there is lot and lots and lots and lots of data that we have to look at and we have very little time to audit. It's hub and spoke model. We used to do it on the basis of crunching data. We didn't have AI, but we used different tools to crunch data. And Sure, when I was trying to find people to do this for us, we were not able to get the right kind of skill sets within our caramel. And AI will play a very, very big role. Even in a small scenario, AI will play a very, very big role in highlighting areas and giving efficiency to whatever work we do at Charter Accountants. Also, in telecommunication, there's much more data than it is there in retail. Also, artificial intelligence will help in identifying, is helping in identifying stray patterns for 
lots of frauds that are going around, lots of things. And with Amazon Go, Amazon Go, I'm sure lots of people might know about Amazon Go. I was in retail, so I know it is coming much faster than we anticipated. I was in retail, so I can say this. We need to be prepared with artificial intelligence or at least some portion of it to be in a position to face up to this particular challenge. Thanks, Babu sir. Thanks, everyone. Always a pleasure listening to you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the idea of this seminar is basically to plant seeds in your mind so that it will nurture and, you know, uh, over a period of time you will start getting interest because you've got to start now. You know, you cannot, uh, you know, if you get into the bandwagon now and start learning about these things, uh, then you'll be there and you'll be in part of that huge tsunami that's going to happen with uh, AI. Thank you. Yeah, I think Babu has proven by his presentation that uh, although he may look that he belongs to Jurassic Age, as far information technology is concerned, he is always uh, kept ahead. I would uh, request uh, Sachidanand, our senior most member, to come and hand over a memento. So it's pleasing to see that our senior most members are also interested in information technology. Th that should be an inspiration to all of you. Yeah, thank you. Now if you